you for being here. <laughs> Thanks, Sherry. Thanks for having me. We're twins today, as we were noticing. You, you gray thought, and black. You would have thought it was a requirement to, yeah. you know, to, to do matching outfits. I had no clue. Recovery colors, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's like we're going to a Raider game. Right, that's true. <laughs> Some Raider party, but we're not. But we're not. Um, I love your energy, I love your spirit, and I love that your movie is getting such a huge buzz and it's winning awards. It's called uh, Long Way Back. The Long, Long Way Back. Long Way Back. The story of Todd Z Man Zalkins, yeah. And this is Todd Z Man right here, everybody. Yeah. So tell us about the movie and I want to hear mm. about your story. Okay. The film, the film has got a few layers to it. Uh, first and foremost, it's, it's my story about growing up in Long Beach and, and running with the, uh, the music crowd that we thrived on, and we, we have a, a lot of great history there. But uh, it tells my story of, of getting essentially addicted to prescription painkillers and also growing up and running with a band known as Sublime, uh, probably our ah. most famous band that's ever come out of, our, out of our music culture, which is so rich in that community. And I was with the, the lead singer, Brad Knoll, on the night that he passed away. Mm. And on the night that he passed away, he tried calling me at 4 a.m. And I had just dropped him off and, uh, at his hotel. And uh, I was staying at the booking manager's house. And I was unable to wake up when he called me. And so for many, many years, I had this terrible sense of grief and, and sense of um, what could I have done. And, to maybe change that. And, and you were using through that grief, I, I Oh, tremendously, yeah. I, I, fell, I fell into a much uh, deeper sense of hell, a much deeper sense of, uh, you know, I had no coping skills as, as, as I think most of us addicts and alcoholics. You know, life skills, no I life didn't skills. have any. Yeah. I wasn't able to cope with that grief and the loss. And um, when, when Brad passed away, his name was Brad Knoll, the singer of Sublime, and his uh -huh. son was 11 months old when, when he passed away. Mm. So you fast forward all these years, I, I, uh, many years later I came into recovery in 2007. I became an interventionist a couple of years later and ultimately Jacob Knoll, who was Bradley's son, he too was suffering with, with uh, drug and alcohol mm. addiction and Bradley's dad gave, gave me a call and said I can't go through with this again. What was your um, desire to actually work in the field and become an interventionist? Did you see a lot of failed interventions? Did you want to do something different? Were you it just, wasn't planned. It wasn't planned. Okay. No, uh, you know, actually what happened was um, at about 18 months sober, I, I wrote a book called, my memoir called Dying for Triplicate. And the gentleman who treated me in Laguna Beach, my addictionologist, uh, Dr. Daniel Hedrick and his staff said, you know, we had never seen uh, something like this before. In fact, mm -hmm. he's He's quoted as saying, uh, as of today, he's treated more than 20,000 patients and he had never seen such a, a, such a horrible detox and such a, such a situation for, for a prescription painkiller addict. And he said, you know, people need to hear about your story. You should write it. And mm. so ultimately, I, I wrote, uh, wrote my story and, and, and today it's sold more than 50,000 copies. And Whoa. what happened was the, the story got out there organically and families and addicts would start contacting me. And, ah. and it, was, it was fun because it, it, was, it was heartwarming for me because I'd be getting contacted by people, you know, either relating or asking for help. And I was really active in my recovery. At about two years sober, uh, an, an interventionist in South Orange County by the name of Jeff Jones, and may he rest in peace, he passed away a couple of years mm. ago. He took me under his wing. He said, okay. he said, you know what, I think that you'd be really good at this work. And um, I was really thankful that he saw that in me, that you know, wow. you, you, you seem to have a great deal of compassion and, uh, for other people and that you want to help. And, and I just, I was drawn to it. I, I wasn't like, I, I had no desire to go work at a treatment center. So did you go and all. get certified and do all of those things? Because, you know, sometimes I think even as a therapist, I'm, I'm a clinician, I'm a yeah. licensed therapist, I feel like I'm doing interventions when families yeah. come in, but I'm really not certified as an interventionist. So yeah. what do you think about all of the certifications, and do you think it's just yeah. an organically natural skill that you well, have? One thing for sure when it comes to intervention is you've got to be trained right. Uh -huh. You know, you can't just be like, well, I you know, uh, let's go get this family together and drag someone off into treatment. It is such a, it's such an intense process. It's such a, um, it's essentially the, the management of a very, very intense emotional crisis. Uh -huh. and, and that's what I, that's what I consider. It's a management of a crisis. And, 
you've got to be effectively trained as to how to manage this. It's mm -hmm. a chess match. All the pieces, the moving pieces. So many moving parts going on, and um, and, and I take a great deal of pride in, in being able to, to be involved with the family and take on not only what they're going through, but to, but to get to the end game result, which is, a, of course, to get the person to treatment, but equally important for me is to see that family get that moment of, of exhale. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my gosh, the person's going to not only go into treatment, but they're, they're going to get to sleep better. So you know? what works and then what doesn't work? In other words, we were talking a little bit early before the interview started, like what is it that makes someone just unwilling, unwilling? And I'm yeah. going to talk about the family and the addict themselves. What is that unwillingness where they just are not willing to do the work? It, it's such a it's such a loaded question that we, yeah. could, we could talk on that topic for hours and I, I've got to tell you that for, first and foremost obviously everyone every individual is different and I think what is gonna wh how does an individual manifest willingness sometimes I think it's a God-given thing mm -hmm. I know for myself uh, I don't know if it was God who gave it to me but I was so desperate I'll, I'll speak from my own personal experience uh -huh. and that is I didn't want my mother to get a call that I that I, I had died from drug addiction, and my my mom was my best friend, and oh, <sighs> you do have so much. You know when you compassion. when you tor when when I was active in my disease and towards the back the last couple of years when you start to push people away that you love so much and that they love you so much I had this a couple of molecules I think just a very small shred of hope that maybe I could change and I think that's maybe where the little tiny it was only a tiny bit of willingness that I had I wasn't sure that I could recover though so to come back to your question like I wish that I could come up with a pill <laughs> called willingness for real because it would cure addiction and I'd have more money than Bill Gates. <laughs> I often say that, for real. Here's a pill. You're all sick, take this pill. And you're all willing to now stop using and stop drinking and you'll come and get a foundation in recovery. You, you'll get some, some bare bones coping skills and you'll start doing the things that, that are necessary in order to recover. What do you know will take you out again? Complacency. Complacency and lack of, uh, lack of vigilance and a disrespect to the program. Mm -hmm. um, and, and getting away from all the things that were taught to me. I, I'm, I'm a pretty routine oriented person. I, I pray and meditate in the mornings. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a pretty systemic guy. Like, you seem like a really happy person. I feel like <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling like this joy. And you know, when I first met you this morning and I just, I felt your glow. And I just, I never take for granted someone like you who has all this time, and maybe it isn't all that much time, I mean, it's 10 years, whatever it is. It's and, 11. But, but <laughs> Darn it, it's one but more to than me, that. me, every minute is, you yeah. know, I, I just don't, I yeah. just never take it for granted I, I, when I meet someone I've got like a, you. You know, it, um, the, joy, the joy for me personally, and, um, and thanks for mentioning Glow, I, I, I have moments where I have days that, are, that, are, that aren't, glowing but I can tell you that it took a long time for me to to feel any sense of of, of real true joy I was a very slow person to recover um, mm. that's within an my skin story okay that's important oh yeah yeah you've you, and, and I know that you haven't seen the film yet but I mean my my detox lasted for my post acute withdrawal symptoms were about 15 months mm. I mean I I didn't sleep for my first 44 days in recovery Wow. So yeah. what were those symptoms that first 15 months M besides Well, lack besides of sleep? the climbiness of the skin and the constant back, back sweats, I mean, you know, I was on the prescription painkillers for almost 17 years. That's a and, long time. And a lot of those years involved the synthetic opiates such as fentanyl and, and a lot of, uh, a tremendous amount of Oxycontin. And so, tremendous amount. So when you stop taking these drugs, the, the byproduct effect is this stuff is in your bones, okay? So even off of heroin, you're going to recover much quicker. So this stuff, it literally stays in your fatty tissue. And so for wow. months, wow. I felt like there was um, insects biting me and just these, um, the skin would not stop crawling and, and, the, and the physical shaking for me lasted for several months. I was constantly like this. 
my legs would chatter. And that was for almost nine months. So you stayed in, though, even though it was Constantly. so uncomfortable. You yeah. stayed in the ring. Yeah, I did. And I did. And uh, But let me back up for a second. I, I put this in my journal. I journaled a lot because I wasn't sleeping too much. But if I didn't get sleep by day 50, I was going to commit suicide. Oh. I didn't sleep for the whole month of March And of that will make you, I mean, you're, you're just not yourself. You're tired, you know, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. I mean. Yeah, and, and when you're seeing people too, like like the maybe the straight alcoholic who's new in recovery, who's maybe feeling good at 10, 12, 15 days, and they're taking a 30-day chip, and I'm going, I can barely talk. I'm slobbering and drooling. I can barely put a you sentence really together. Sick. It was terrible. And so when you're not, when you're not feeling it and, and you're, and there's no joy and laughter within yourself. You're like, what is this about? Do why I am I doing this? Exactly. And, and when the finish line seems so far away, which it did for me, the finish line, if you, when I say the finish line, gosh, when am I going to feel comfortable? When will I start getting decent night's sleep and start laughing again? It was forever in a day to get there. So what would you <laughs> say to that person watching this right now that's in, that, in yeah. your shoes? That's, um, oh, we're in your shoes. Yeah, I, I always like to impress upon those people who have a similar story to mine that it will happen. And, and, it's, and it's my biggest asset th today is that that block and that period of pain that I went through, and that was effing substantial pain. It was substantial. Well, and you, you are a miracle, Todd. It's important to, to share that with people. And why is it? changed so much since the 70s and 80s. I mean, I, I was a hospice social worker, okay, yeah. back in um, 2000 to 2005. I worked with families that had cancer, and that was when you saw things like OxyContin and so forth, and that yeah. was the only time mm -hmm. at that time I had ever heard of these drugs. Yeah. Um, and, you know, of course, you threw them down the toilet when the, the person passed. Yeah. How did this get into everybody's hands, and, it, and how is it changing, and what's the future solution? Yeah, it, it, if, you do, if you do enough research, it's, it's easy to, to find that uh, early on, OxyContin was essentially marketed as something that wasn't really addictive. And it was heavily marketed to, to physicians uh, for, for mild to severe pain, where, where really it's something that should be for people who are in absolute um, uh, acute horrific pain, I think, for, for, for significant surgeries, uh, post-surgical, post, you know, post mm -hmm. cancer, mm -hmm. burn victims, mm -hmm. the same with fentanyl and stuff right. like that. So you have, this, you have these, um, these uh, situations where there's tremendous marketing and tremendous incentive, by the way, for doctors to, to prescribe. To prescribe. Mm -hmm. So this didn't happen, by the way. We didn't get here overnight. No. You know, for those of you who, who are going to be watching, we didn't get here in five years. This started in the early 90s for this thing to start really, really, wow. the bubble for it to start really even getting close to bursting. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Because we never, it, when I was doing hospice, I mean, you had to really monitor those pills because you didn't want anybody to take them. Yeah. But, but you weren't really trained like, oh, there may be an addict in the family. You better be careful. Where are yeah. you going to keep these medications? None of that was going on. We weren't really trained on that. And I think we probably should have been. Yeah. It's, you know, um, I got sober even before, in 2007, it wasn't really even an epidemic yet. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, if you want to call it my moment of clarity, when I crawled into the hospital, when I crawled, I was limping, but I had a prescription for a brand new drug on the market. It was called, it, it's called Opana, O-P-A-N-A, -A, and it's extremely, it's fiercely powerful. And it, it's, it's all over the East Coast. And I'd never taken it. And I'm like, well, maybe I'll just keep that in case I need it when I get out of the hospital. You know, maybe I'll just need that. So I hit the hospital entrance doors and I turn around. And as, as weak as I was, I remember going back to my car and I got the prescription and I tore it up. There and I go. think that was my moment of like, I, I really need, need to try to not die. And, and give this a chance, right? But that was a new drug in 2007, Opana. Look it up. It was, wow, it, I never that, heard of it. It was just on the market, and it's terrible as far as its uh, potency. Wow. So yeah. the music industry was what you grew up in. Yeah. You lost your best friend. Well, he was a close friend close of mine. Friend. Yeah, he was, a, he, was, he was the best friend to all of us. Best yeah. friend. And, and so why the music industry? Why is it just so prevalent, and why <laughs> is there so much scrutiny? 
You know, I, I think when it comes to, when you're in that environment of playing music and, and, and being in those moments of, you know, it starts out with backyard parties and it seems so innocent and, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're chasing girls and having fun, that's just the culture. I think that uh, it's just something that um, is so obvious. Like the groupies and everybody. You no, know, I just think it's natural. I think it's a natural Were thing. Were you a musician too? Were yeah, you actually... I've, I've sang in a punk band for years and oh, it's like, okay. But, but it's like, I think it's a natural draw for, okay, we're going to drink, we're going to do some drugs, you know, we may or may not surf tomorrow, we're going to be with some chicks, we're going to play some music, and that's what we do. <laughs> it's the culture. It's just what we do. And so in Long Beach, we've, we've done it well for a long time, and, and a lot of people have died. Yeah. You know, the, the founder of this magazine talks a lot about sober fun and community. Yeah. You know, how do we start teaching young people about sober fun? I like, love that. I love that topic. Uh, I'm glad that you brought that up because, it, it, you know, even on my own podcast, I like to bring on people who are living full, happy lives sober. And it's important that, that uh, and by the, by the way, if I didn't have fun sober, I'd bail. Right. You know, it's 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 a better life, despite you know we have days that are sometimes. I'm glad that days are different, because here's then the thing. Then you can enjoy the great days. Here's the thing: when 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 I was addicted, every day had to be the same. Meaning, I'm always addicted. Here we go again. Here we go again. I got to do this again, every single day. So there's no hope for anything different. It's, it's just a repeated, There's it's, no ground, possibility. it's Groundhog Drug Day, okay? <laughs> right. But with, with sobriety, I never really know what the day is going to bring. Oh, what a great point. You know, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but generally speaking, it's going to be a full day. It'll be a full day, and, and even better, I'm not going to miss it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to miss it. So uh, the payoff is, the payoff is huge in that I get to experience the day. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I always talk about pure potentiality. Like, pure potentiality exists beyond all of the all of the drugs, all of the fear, yeah, all of the codependency. Like, yeah. that's where all the miracles exist. That's what I mean by pure potential. I mean, all the possibilities exist. You know that that's a really good point. You know, when we stop doing all the stuff we're doing, I, I think one of the first things that happens to I, I look at it as we're kind of growing into some new skin to begin with. To begin with, when we're new in sobriety we're really growing in the new skin. So there's a lot of fear as we're a newcomer, okay? But the beautiful thing is, is if we hang around long enough, we get to find out who we really are. Mm -hmm. You know, we get to you take find the mask out. Off. Yeah, how cool is it to find out the things that you thought that you m might have been interested in when you were loaded can completely change as you start to grow up in recovery and find new passions and projects hobbies or jobs or education, whatever it might be, but you get to find out. So you know. when you look at, you know, pre-sobriety and post-sobriety, who were you then and who are you now? It, it's the, at the core. I'm thankful that I still have my sense of humor, by the way. I <laughs> thought that maybe, you know, at my core, um, I'm softer. Mm. Mm. I'm softer because addiction hardens us. When, you're, when, you, when you hate yourself. Mm. When this you, is very up close and personal for you, me, having a family member. And, it, um, and, and I think about, for instance, sometimes the way I would be short with my mother. You know? That irritability. Write her a check and race out the door because I'm often, you know, I've been helping to support my mom for years. But to not be able to be there to to love her in person and to listen to her, that's failing as a son. Mm. And I don't fail as a son today, so I think... What a miracle. So I think at my core, um, you know... I'm I, hearing the word connect. I'm feeling the word connection. Connecting with people yeah. and, and certainly being more loving and kind, but, um, but growing up a lot too, and, and, my, and, my, and my sense of just, my sense of what the measure of a man is is entirely different. Ah. It's, the measure of a man to me is much more about, um, this may sound corny, actually, but it's not for me. Well, I it's, love your transparency, Todd. It, 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 uh, the measure of a man to me is, is first and foremost, um, what are you doing for others? 
and not so much for yourself. But um, how much how much effing love do you have in here? Because when you have it in here, you're able to transmit it out there. So so I'm a lot less angry of a guy uh, because for a lot of years towards the end, I truly truly hated the man that I'd become. Mm -hmm. Right. So you turned that outward. Was, you <laughs> yeah. turned the anger outward, even though it was really in an inward job. Oh gosh, and it wasn't the exterior stuff. It was all me. Yeah. It, it was the the person yeah. that I'd become. I despised. So some of the things you've done since you've become sober is um, you have an organization called Four Keys. Can you tell yeah. me about that? Yeah, the Four Keys. It's it's um, it's one of my companies, and the Four Keys encompasses a few things. It's it's um, there's public speaking involved in that. I travel all over the country. I speak at a lot of colleges, and and in the in those environments, we we sh will show the film to a lot of students in recovery, backed up That's by a great. speaking event, and and it's that connectivity with um, uh, people on campus who and it, they don't have to even be in recovery, yeah. but um, and not just at colleges, but in treatment centers as well. Mm -hmm. I have this thing called Next Level where. I give talks, which is to help these people who are in treatment take their recovery to the next level once they're out of treatment. Right, right. So it, it's really important to me to, to help to motivate and inspire people to, to share with them the necessary things that I, the things that I feel are really necessary for them to do once they leave treatment. Well, that brings me up to what we were talking about earlier. You said that you like to send kids sometimes out of town. You want to get them out of their environment. Yeah. However, what if they go, I, I'm asked this all the time, what if I send my kid over there and mm -hmm. then they come back, then what? Like their community was at the treatment center, yeah. at the sober living, all the things they were doing for 30, 60, 90 days, and yeah. then they come back home and they've lost that. So yeah. how do you speak to that? Yeah, transitional work is important. Yeah. You know? And let's come back to what you just, you just mentioned, 30, 60, 90. I won't, I'll never uh, engage a young person with 30 days of treatment. The, the statistical fact is that um, an individual is five times more likely to, to get one or more years clean and sober if they do 90 days in treatment. Mm -hmm. I will never ever, even if, if a family says, well, we only want Jimmy to do 30 days, I'm not gonna work with you. So you actually have a boundary. Like I will I say just, I'm, I'm not working with you. Because you know you won't be successful. You're setting them up for failure. You're, or they will, yeah. You're, 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 your loved one is not even close to even being physically stable yet. So why am I even gonna, I'm not gonna waste your time or your money. You can hire someone else, I'm fine with it. So after 90 days they come home, then how do you help them transition <clears throat> into Re life? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think that having a program of accountability with the family and the, in, in the individual is super important. And so often, what, uh, my, you know, I'm a licensed KDAC and, and, the, and my colleagues are as well, mm -hmm. the advanced uh, KDACs, and, and um, we like to either have some type of family unit regular meetings with the individuals where, as well as the family, look for not only behavioral, types of changes, but mm -hmm. some type of system where, there, where there's routine that, that is being implemented that shows that, that the person is doing this thing called recovery. Right, right. Let's okay? follow up. Yeah, follow up and, and, and not, not so much micromanaging, but, but families don't really have any idea what recovery looks like. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and often their perception is, well, we sent you know, our son, our daughter, or whoever it is, we send them to treatment, we get them back brand new and we're good to go. It's just well, beginning, you know. You're so right. And then the other issue is you can know everything about recovery. And what I was telling you earlier about my own situation is then you can fall asleep to yeah. what is going on and just accept the unacceptable Yeah, you, you, in your you, family. You brought up a really good point with that. And, and that I think the family, too, needs to, needs to also be vigilant in their own either program or with their own therapeutic process because the family, too, is still broken. Yeah. The family is still hurting. Even though, even, even though they have, they may not recognize it. They're still hurting. Oh, absolutely. And you know? and speak to the family. What would you tell a family person who just cannot get that person, you know, sober? That their child just will not do this thing. Uh, if they won't. Well, they can't get the child sober. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, you can, yeah. Like, what, what is the you know? When do you give up? When is it yeah. tough love? And when do you support the recovery and not enable the disease? Yeah, there there does come a, a point in time where you know sharing with someone. Here, let me back up for a second. So long as someone still has a pulse, I don't ever give up hope on the mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. I I actually in, uh, I have a gentleman that has now four years sober. He went to treatment 22 times. Mm -hmm. I hear that all now, the time. Now, yes, is it a broken record? 
Of course it is. And is it defeating? Yes, it is to the family. It's defeating. Oh, here we go again. They're going again. They're going again. I think it's important to share with the family that it's important for them to protect their own emotional state. It's important for them to protect their own spiritual state and for their own self-care because they get stuck in this constant state of worry about the individual and they set aside their own self-care. Exactly. That person is their addiction. Completely. That they are obsession. addicted to it and, and in fact uh, the, the addict is the one who runs the entire family dynamic. Completely. And, so, and if, for instance, I'll throw a name out, if Johnny's having a good week, the family's having a good week. Right. If it's terrible, oh boy, the world is coming to an end. So I think that, the, that the, it's important for the family to have their own sense of program, whether it's on a therapeutic basis, Al-Anon, combination of, you know. Completely, completely. Yeah. Um, so what is next? What's next for you? Or do you want to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the, the Knoll Family Foundation? Well, right, well, in a couple of days, I got to fly to the Midwest and do an intervention. So I still do a lot of intervention work mm -hmm. coincided with the public speaking and, um, and that passion project, which is the Knoll Family Foundation. And the Knoll Family Foundation is, is essentially going to, it, it, that's kind of the, the parent over what's called Bradley's House. And, mm -hmm. In Brad, Brad Knoll's memory, we're opening, it's the first treatment center of its kind because it's going to be a full service, it's a nonprofit facility that will be treating, dedicated to treating musicians who are addicted to heroin and other mm. opiates. It'll be based in South Orange County and we plan on opening it uh, towards the end of this year. Uh, we have several music benefits. We already had one this last week, but a massive one is being planned right so th now. So this is for either celebrity musicians or non-celebrity musicians? Anybody that is a musician? Yeah, so long as they are accredited musician. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, as well as it, we'll also treat their management or, or their roadies. Got you it. know what I mean? Oh, if, okay. if they there are you affiliated, you bet. Yeah, okay. and, and so we just had our first meeting actually with Music Cares a couple of weeks ago. So we plan on oh, taking great. that relationship to some type of an alliance have yeah. so much respect they for what they do so much for people so long way time. back yeah. um, where can we find you where can we find your movie okay maybe the, let the long way know. back yeah the long way back film is available on hulu uh, we just had a uh, struck a deal with them for two years and it'll probably be on there for another two great uh, as well as amazon google play itunes wow. and yeah, it'll be there forever Oh, that's amazing! Yeah. You've, you know, you've you've set a legacy, really. <laughs> well, here the, the beautiful thing that, that we've come to find, and we've gotten hundreds of emails from people all over the country, and even in the UK and Australia, mm -hmm. is that the film was made um, to to send a message of awareness, uh, hope, and and some education, and so it's already prompted some people to check into treatment, which is awesome. That is awesome. And it's and it's and it's really. Um, you can ask for nothing more than when someone gets send you a note going, you know what, I saw this film and, and it's given me some hope that I can Does that not I can get better than that, that I can recover. That that was the sole purpose of it. Mm. Well, so, I can't wait to dive into it. And yeah, watch it. you I'm got some DVDs do I do. I have some downstairs work to do, for you for sure. Yeah. Well, anything else you want to say? Any hope, inspiration? Because that's what we're about Gosh. at Recovery Today. You know, yeah. if uh, if anyone out there who's watching uh, is feeling hopeless, um, there is hope, and and I'm sure that. Uh, Recovery today is, it, they're a wonderful resource. So uh, if you're still breathing, you can do this thing. And, uh, and, and contact us, you know, you can do it. Uh, I, I'm breathing because of recovery and I, I've never done it alone. So if you're struggling, there, there's, there's resources out there that can, that can help you get well and have exactly. a really full and happy life. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Thank you. You're such a great yeah, guy. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm going to give you a big yeah, hug. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a hug. hug. Always. Oh, man, I just dropped that mic. Oh, well, we always do that. <laughs> thanks, thanks <laughs> thank Sherry. You, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Okay.